Hello, this is Russ Walden with Father's Heart Ministry. This is the Morning Light Daily Bible Study. Today we are studying Mark chapter 12, the foreknowledge of Jesus. In Mark chapter 12, Jesus delivers a parable to the scribes and elders predicting his own death. Also, the destruction of Jerusalem and the coming of the church age in just a few short sentences. Now, for us, this is an example of no matter how clueless the disciples remained about what was about to happen in terms of Jesus' death, Jesus himself more than once fully informed them as he fully informs us about those things that are ahead for us in the earth and in our own personal lives. There's a move of God coming, says the Father, and I'm making a preparation and overtures that you will not just be an observer, but you will be a participator in it. You're not going to be left out, says God, but I choose you, I choose you, says the Father. And I include you, and I am moving by my Spirit to sweep you into uh, the very center of the very central current of that which I'm doing in this day, says the Lord. I want to pray for you. I want to pray for the sick today. Jesus, we come before you and we pray for our partners, our listeners and viewers. We pray for the, them in the area of their health. God, that you would bring reprieve to those in physical, emotional, and spiritual distress today. Father, you are the God of battle, and you are abundant in grace, and we ask that you would show mercy upon them, that are those that are suffering, Father, those that have physical ailments. Jesus, place your hand on that ailment. Cancers, diabetes, uh, diseases, infirmities. Place your hand right now, just as Jesus, you would place your hand and release your healing virtue. As you cured many during your earthly ministry, Jesus, I, I ask right now that you would Move by the, by the reality of your creative powers upon those that are listening and watching that are sick in body. You're the God of signs and wonders. Surprise the enemy now with a miraculous cure by the Holy Ghost. Bring suffering to an end right now, Jesus. For by your stripes and by your blood, we look back to healing as a past provision. O oh, King of glory, let the report be that the amendment came, the healing came, the deliverance came to every person listening and watching today in their physical, emotional, and spiritual infirmities. In Jesus' name. Do you receive it? I want to hear from you. I want to hear your testimony. Walden at gmail.com that's R-U-S-S-E-L-L-W-A-L-D-E-N at Gmail. We want to begin by reading Mark 12 in its entirety. And Jesus began to speak to them by parables. A certain man planted a vineyard, and he set a hedge about it. And he digged a place for the wine fat and built a tower and let it out to husbandmen and went into a far country. And at this season, he sent the husbandman to the husbandman a servant that he might receive from the husbandman the fruit of the vine. And they caught him and beat him and sent him away empty. And again he sent unto them another servant. And at this servant they cast stones and wounded him in the head and sent him away shamefully handled. And he sent another, and they... And him they killed, and many others, beating some and killing some. My goodness. Having yet therefore one son, his well-beloved, he sent him also last unto them, saying, They will reverence my son. 
But those husbandmen said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance shall be ours. And they took him, they took the son, and they killed him and cast him out of the vineyard. What therefore shall the Lord of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the husbandmen and give the vineyard unto others. And have you not read this scripture? The stone which the builders rejected is become the head of the corner. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. And they sought to lay hold on him, but feared the people, for they knew he had spoken the parable against them, and they left him and went their way. And they sent unto him certain of the Pharisees and of the Herodians to catch him in his words. And when they were come, they say unto him, Master, we know that you are true and care for no man. For you regard not the person of men, but teaches the way of God in truth. Is it lawful to give tribute to Caesar or not? Shall we give or shall we not give? But he, knowing their hypocrisy, said unto them, Why tempt ye me? Bring me a penny that I may see it. And they brought it. And he said unto them, Whose is this image and superscription? And they said unto him, Caesar's. And Jesus answered unto them, Render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. And they marveled at him. Then come the unto him the Sadducees, which say there is no resurrection. They asked him, saying, Master, Moses wrote unto us, If a man's brother die and leave his wife behind him and have no children, that his brother should take his wife and raise up seed to his brother. Now there were seven brethren, and the first took a wife, and dying left no seed. And the second took her and died, neither left he any seed, and the third likewise. And the seven had her, and left no seed. Last of all, the woman died also. In the resurrection... Therefore, when they shall rise, whose wife shall she be of them? For the seven had her to wife. And Jesus answering said unto them, You do err. Uh, do you not therefore err? Because you know not the scriptures, neither the power of God. For when they shall rise from the dead, they shall neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels which are in heaven. And as touching the dead that they rise, have you not read in the book of Moses how in the bush God spake unto him, saying, I am the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob? He is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. Ye therefore do greatly err. First they erred, now they're greatly erring. And one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together and perceiving that he had answered well, asked of him, Which is the first commandment of all? And Jesus answered him, The first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and all thy mind, with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is like, uh, namely this, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And there is none other greater commandment than these. And the scribe said unto him, Well, master, thou hast said the truth, for there is one God, and there is none other than he. And to love him with all the heart, and with all the understanding, with all the soul, and all the strength, and to love his neighbor as himself is more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that he answered him discreetly, he said unto him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. And no man dared to ask him any question after that. And Jesus answered and said, while he taught in the temple, How say the scribes that Christ is the son of David? For David himself said by the Holy Ghost, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand while I make thy enemies my footstool. David therefore himself called him Lord, and whence is he then his son? And the common people heard him gladly. And he said unto them in his doctrine, Beware of the scribes which love to go in long clothing and love salutations in the marketplaces, and the chief seats in the synagogues, and the uppermost rooms at feasts, which devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayers. These shall receive greater damnation. And Jesus sat over against the treasury, and beheld how the people cast money into the treasury, 
And many that were rich cast in much. And there came a certain poor widow, and she threw in two mites, which make a farthing. And he called unto him his disciples, and said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that this poor widow hath cast in more than all they that have cast into the treasury. For all they did cast in of their abundance, but she of her want did cast in all that she had, even all her living. So back to the beginning of our chapter. In this chapter, Jesus begins a series of parables with the story of a man leaving a vineyard in the care of unworthy vine dressers. For Jesus hears, it would have been unambiguous to them that he was referencing Isaiah 5, 1 through 7, where the prophet clearly declares the nation of Israel and the descendants of Jacob to be the vineyard of God. In the parable that Jesus gives, the servants are sent by the master to gather fruit from the vineyard and are rebuffed and treated harshly, even to the point of killing some of them. Who are these? These are the prophets sent in earlier times from God to the kings and priests in Jerusalem, who almost without exception, what happened to them? They were rejected, they were abused by those who disdained their message. Jesus' listeners would have clearly understood this, and in understanding it, they would have excluded themselves. Well, surely that's not us. They, they say, this is what our fathers did before the captivity, but now things are different. Don't we say that today? But Jesus makes the connection that they have missed. He declares that the master has now sent unto them his only son. And in the parable, the unworthy vine dressers take the son and kill him, prompting the destruction of these evil men. Now, in these few lines, Jesus has predicted his own death and the destruction of Jerusalem and the leveling of the temple in 70 AD. He then goes one step further and foreshadows the church age beyond in saying that the stone rejected by the builders will yet become the head of the corner, the chief cornerstone of the purposes of God, the purposes of God expressed in the church after the fall of Jerusalem. Now the elders and scribes immediately moved to take hold of Jesus, but they feared the people. So they refrained and they went their way. And this was not a discussion. There was no pause to indicate for one moment that they considered whether or not they should repent of their actions or their attitude. Repentance was not in their mind. Repenting of their actions or their attitude toward this young miracle worker. Jesus' miracles didn't move them. His loving demeanor did not persuade them. They were entrenched in their own sense of self-referral and therefore they were doomed. Now, after leaving Jesus, they don't give up. They send other challengers to catch Jesus in his words. What did they do? They ask a question about paying taxes, whether paying taxes is a just and legitimate imposition upon the people of God. Jesus, how does he answer them? He simply dismisses them with the examination of a coin presented, whereupon he says, hey, render unto Caesar, what? What do we render unto Caesar? that which is Caesar's, and unto God, that which is God's. And this is still a question being asked today. Many question whether it is godly to pay taxes to a government whose policies are so deeply secular and unabiding and disrespectful of Christian faith. Let's remember that Jesus, not for one moment, ever advocated such civil disobedience as not paying taxes. In fact, Jesus was known to pay his own taxes. What would Jesus do? He would pay his taxes. What does it tell us? Remember that the regime over which Jerusalem was ruled was very cruel, corrupt, and ungodly. The Nazi regime of the 1940s would blush at the extremes 
to which Rome went, the Roman, the Roman occupiers went every day to savage those under the jackboot of the Emperor Nero at the time, Tiberius before him. It's interesting that Jesus never called for an activist church and he never called for an insurgent church. He simply declared that his kingdom was not of this world and therefore his servants would not fight against such things with natural means. This is counter to the foregone conclusions we make today. What do we make foregone conclusions about? About our rights and privileges in a society held in stewardship by a representative government. We have to balance our democratic sentiments then with kingdom values. We have to balance our democratic sentiments with kingdom values. What happens next? They come and challenge Jesus with a parable. Seeing that they could not effectively challenge Jesus' own parables, they're making up parables. And they tell Jesus the theoretical account of seven brothers who marry the same woman, one right after another, each leaving no children uh, after their own deaths. And the question is, who will claim the woman as their wife in the resurrection? Jesus simply dismisses the question because the people are asked what, what they're asking. They don't believe, the people that are asking the question don't believe in the resurrection in the first place. And that he also goes on to say that there is no, no marrying or giving in marriage in heaven because those in heaven will be like the angels. Now, does that mean there will be no gender in heaven? Not necessarily. But rather there will not be a need for the estate of marriage as we know it. Let's move on. In verse 28, we see a lone instance of one of the scribes setting aside his prejudices toward Jesus. And what does he do? He asks a sincere question. Which is the first commandment of all? The first commandment is to love God with all of your being and secondly, to love your neighbor as oneself. The scribe readily agrees to this. The scribe remarks that to love God is absolutely the first priority and that loving one's neighbor is more important than all the religious protocols uh, that uh, are imposed by the illegitimate authorities of Jesus' day. In verse 34, Jesus observes this man. He watches him and he sees the thoughtfulness of the man's answer and he declares that he's, this man is not very far from the kingdom. Upon seeing how persuasive Jesus is, that one of their own is well nigh converted, the scribes, the Pharisees, the elders, and the Herodians, they became afraid and they dared not ask him any more questions. They probably thought he was mesmerizing them. He was bewitching them. In reflecting on this conversation between Jesus and the scribe, we might ask ourselves the same questions. Is it really so absolutely inviolate that we must adhere to the protocols and regimens of religious expectation imposed upon us by Christian culture or by Christian leaders? Behold now the yoke easy and the burden light. Loving God and loving one's neighbor in spirit and in truth is more important than the whole of Christian tradition, expectation, and demand that others might make in their self-presumed authority to dictate to you what constitutes a Christian life well lived. Having interacted at length with these self-appointed authorities, Jesus turns to his disciples and he warns them. He, he, what does he warn them? He warns them not to follow in their example as those who, what? They love an outward show of piety, but inwardly they're full of greed and avarice. They devour widows' houses, all the while trembling with false piety and loud in long prayers with hands raised toward heaven with one eye open watching to make sure everybody else sees just how godly they are. How many of us have seen that in Christian culture? Finally, Jesus, being in the temple, stands to watch the people giving 
of their livelihoods to the maintenance of the program of God. There are many today who insist that God is not at all interested in such things. But here Jesus is looking into the treasury, watching what people give. There are people that insist that money and finances are a mundane thing of no spiritual interest, but it's just such an amazing thing that Jesus would be in their allegedly so inappropriately inquisitive as to actually make note not only of who was giving, but how much each person was giving. Can you imagine your pastor coming along with the ushers, examining and counting each gift, noting the amount written on each check as it was deposited in the little offering receptacle? How many of us would be saying to ourselves, uh, that's inappropriate, but this is exactly what Jesus did. We might say, this is my last Sunday here, but Jesus is doing that very thing. How amazing. As he's standing by, he makes note of a woman greatly impoverished, casting in of all her living. Wow. What a scandal. What if a poor old widow on a fixed income co-signed her subsistence check and put it in the offering basket of your church this Sunday? What if your pastor, upon learning of it, failed to return the check to the dear old spinster? Would it not be a scandal? But this is exactly what Jesus does. What can we learn from this? There's a disparity between how we think about money and how Jesus thinks about money, between our personal ethics and such matters and the obvious attitude of Jesus, it's an indicator of how deeply money has become a false god in our lives, whether we realize it or not. We tend to clothe ourselves with mock pity and religious indignation when in fact something much less flattering is driving our imagined offense at the handling of such things. As for the woman, Jesus honors her and praises her for her heart of worship and her sacrificial love as an example for all of us to follow and not rather to see her as an object of pity. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for young John Mark when he got his act together and traveled with Peter and learned all these Jesus stories that the Gospel of Mark entails. We're so appreciative. We rejoice in you today, Lord, and we thank you in Jesus' name.